And I'm very pleased to introduce you to John Weiss. So John, again, is a master gardener in Larimer County. He has done multiple presentations on various subjects, including vegetables and orchids. And we're thrilled that he is presenting with us today. So John, thank you for presenting and take it away. Very good. Well, thanks, Allison. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so today we're going to talk about planning your vegetable garden for 21. I realize that many of you um, either uh, are new to uh, vegetable gardening, want to uh, increase your current vegetable garden, or maybe uh, have vegetable gardens in the past and looking for little tidbits. So hopefully we can answer most, if not all, those various questions. The presentation is kind of broken, you'll see, into two parts. The first part is planning a vegetable garden and things to consider. And then the second half, we'll talk briefly about some vegetables uh, which you might want to consider here in the front range. So let's get going, maybe. Okay, it's going to do this for me. Why are you doing this? All right, hang on. Let me go here and see if I can get this to go again. It worked before. There we go. Um, so why are you gonna grow a vegetable garden? Especially for those who are new to it or thinking about it. Well, you get that satisfaction of growing your own food and knowing where it came from. We have this organic versus non-organic. Uh, you might wanna grow foods to give to others. Um, I think it's real important to think about growing things that you might not normally find in local markets, whether they're supermarkets or even the farmer's markets. Gardening is a really good form of exercise. You go up and down, you bend a lot. And it's really a great experience if you happen to have uh, young children. But just some things to think about why you wanna grow a garden. So here are some questions to ask yourself when you begin planning your veggie garden. What vegetables will grow well in your area? And or what vegetables do I want to grow? Um, what soil types are common in your area? What unique conditions in the garden should you consider? Do you have high winds in certain parts? Are your soils compacted or are they very uh, sandy soils? What kind of drainage do you have? Do you have areas in your garden area where there's low uh, settlements so you have wet spots? What are the first and last frost dates? For us up here in the front range, very important. And then what is the length of your growing harvest season? And so part of this is what types of vegetables do you want to grow? How much time do they need, do you need to have for them to grow and mature so that you can harvest them? So these are questions you probably need to, you know, ask yourself, take a sheet of paper, write some things down and start thinking about, you know, where is the best location um, to put my garden? The uh, site of your garden is going to be determined based on a lot of things. How much sun are you getting in that area? Um, what's the soil type and other factors? Uh, things like tomatoes, your warm season crops, tomatoes, peppers, really require a lot of light. Your root vegetables like uh, carrots and beets, turnips, uh, can get by with less light. And some of the leafy vegetables, most notably um, lettuce, are probably the most shade tolerant. So a good way to think about where you might want to situate your garden is to kind of put out some stakes in the area that you maybe first think about. I want to put it in my backyard in that corner. Well, put some stakes out there and then go out there a couple of times during the day and see how much sunlight you have. And you might find that one half gets sun all the time and the other half gets sun in the morning and not in the afternoon. So that will help you figure out, is that a good location? And if that's a good location, you might wanna draw a little picture and indicate that this half gets all day sun, that half gets partial shade. So that when you get ready to plant your vegetables, 
you have that reference there and you can plant those that take less sun in the shadier part and those that require more uh, sunlight in the sunny part. So you can do a lot of this now, uh, realizing that of course in the middle of the summer, you're going to get a little different sun shade pattern, but at least you'll have a pretty good idea of how it should, um, what you should see in the middle of the summer. So again, you can do all these things right now. You don't have to wait till 21 to get started. So some more ideas to think about. If you're gonna plant directly into the ground, if you have a big enough backyard or someplace where you wanna just go straight in the ground, you wanna really consider what type of soil you have. Is it clay? Is it sandier? Um, is it shallow? Can you put a shovel all the way in and dig it nicely? Because it's important um, for knowing this so that you understand that each type of vegetable has a different kind of root uh, needs. Some are very deep rooted like tomatoes, others are very shallow like onions. So you wanna keep that in mind. And then by knowing what your ground is like at this point, will help you develop a plan to improve upon it, to add things to it so it's a better soil type. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. You wanna to try to avoid planting near trees and shrubs and other things because they get into competition between the various plants. And when you have competition, some plants win out and others don't. And vegetables have a tendency not to uh, win out very well. And then it's real important to know how your soil in that area drains. And so there may be some things you can do now to improve the drainage of the area rather than wait later on in the spring. So again, you can write these down and then come up with plans. And you, you know, uh, what you think is a great location, after you kind of go through this, these various steps, you may find that you actually have a better location someplace else, uh, say in the backyard. So good air movement is important. You want to have a good air movement, but you don't want to have excessive wind if you can help it. And we know up here in the front range, there are days where the wind really blows. And what wind does is generally dry out the plants, dries out the soil. And you want to try to minimize that if you can. Um, choosing, a, choosing a place that has easy accessibility for water is, is important because you want to have something convenient is to get your water. And as, as to convenience, you wanna have a place for the vegetable garden where you can see it or visit it frequently because you wanna monitor it through the growing season. You wanna know when the plants are ready for harvest. You wanna be able to check it to see if you have any pests or other issues related to it. And if it's way back in the back 40, you might have a tendency to forget about it. So try to plan it where you see it frequently and where it's relatively close to a source of water. So let's talk, get into a little bit more depth on where to garden. So if you choose to garden directly into the existing soil, you want to, first of all, I would recommend you do a soil test. And you can do a soil test. You can take one sample, say from the middle of the garden, depending on how large it is, or you can take several samples and combine them into one bucket and then send that a sample out of that bucket for a test. And CSU can do the test. Um, there are other labs that can do that. But what you wanna do when you write your report to test this soil, let them know that it's going to be a vegetable garden because their recommendations to a certain extent will depend on what the end use is. So send a, a soil sample in if you haven't, that will help because in most cases, you're going to want to improve the existing soil. Um, you can improve it by adding manure, you can add compost or any combination, uh, shredded uh, leaves or grass clippings, 
And what you're doing is trying to build up the organic matter. And many of our soils in this area are quite clay. So not only are you building up the organic uh, material, you're improving drainage, adding uh, valuable nutrients to the soil. And it may take you several years to do it, um, but after a while, you'll have a really good soil uh, to plant veggies in. And you can start planting vegetables the first season. You're just improving it every year you're adding to the garden to improve the soil type. So we have raised beds and containers, you know, and, and a lot of folks in the front range grow veggies in raised beds. And I hear about more and more people growing them in containers. Uh, raised beds are, are convenient. I would say that at a minimum, they should be 12 inches in depth. It does depend on what you plan to grow. So if you're growing very shallow crops like uh, lettuce or onions, 12 inches would be adequate. If you're growing things like tomatoes and peppers and long carrots, you would probably want to increase the height to give you uh, a greater uh, soil volume because the roots will penetrate all the way down there. So, once you establish where you're going to put your raised beds, some questions to, uh, to ask or some things to consider is, are you going to put the raised bed over an existing soil? Uh, and if the answer is yes, what you want to do is before you start uh, putting uh, or backfilling the raised uh, bed container with soil, you want to go in there and break up the soil, like take the grass out if you're planting it on top of grass. Uh, you want to go down and actually improve the existing soil a little bit. I, I like to go down at least 12 inches if I can and mix it up, turn it over, add some compost, because you're going to have that transition. If you don't do that, a lot of the deep rooted plants grow to the bottom of the raised bed and then they hit that old soil and they won't go any further down because it's so compact. So if you try to make a transition between the existing soil and the new soil, if you will, that you put into the raised bed, the plants are happier. That transition makes them grow better. Um, you can build a, a, a raised bed that allows you to add height to it over time. So you just need, if you build with, uh, say, uh, two by fours or four by fours in each corner. You can put it a little bit higher so that maybe over a year or two you can add height to it if that's what um, you feel is appropriate. The other thing to think about on raised beds is the overall height. So depending upon whom you are, and there are many, I've seen many gardens with raised beds that are uh, so high to accommodate people, for instance, in wheelchairs. Or for those of us who are getting on in time, bending over is maybe more of a challenge. So maybe building it up higher allows you to work your veggie plot uh, with less stress on, on parts of your body. So that's really important. Um, the type of medium that you would put in your raised beds um, can vary. I know of at least one uh, vendor here in Fort Collins that sells what they call a raised bed blend, which is some topsoil with compost mixed in. And that's a good combination. Um, straight soil, uh, topsoil would, would work. I would add some compost to it anyway. Some of the soilless mixes, uh, I think some of those are a little lightweight. Um, they may not retain as much moisture something to think about. Um, some of the roots penetrate better, but you still want to have some water retention in whatever uh, media that you eventually use to fill your raised beds. When we go to containers, it's really pretty much the same thing. Containers are really just large pots. I have a couple of friends who use um, large metal uh, containers, which let's say farmers use or ranchers use to water their livestock, they just buy those empty um, stainless steel or whatever they're made out of uh, tubs 
and just fill them with uh, soil, they punch some holes. So when you have containers, make sure that they have drainage in the bottoms, whether it's a ceramic pot or uh, some other type, make sure you have drainage uh, on the bottom and uh, then, then fill it up. Um, some people might put a layer of gravel on the bottom of their containers to improve the drainage and then fill it up with uh, whatever soil type you're gonna use. And then you can plant directly into those. Some people will put their containers on uh, dollies, if you will, so they can move them around, uh, say on the patio or someplace, because they can get pretty heavy to move, especially if you wanna um, move them in to maybe protect them from uh, a late season uh, frost or some early season uh, cold weather. So there are a lot of things to think about before you go out and uh, you know build them. Um, I've been asked, for instance, how wide should they be? It depends on how many angles you want to use, how many angles you're going to penetrate. So if you're going to go from one side and that's all, uh, you probably want to reach, which is maybe two to three feet, that's as wide as you want. If you can have access from either side, then you can probably double that, give or take, about six feet, so that you can get in on one side and then go around and get the other side. Um, so there are things to consider um, as you design these raised beds and you can use whatever type of material that you want to use to actually uh, structurally build them. So selecting vegetables for your garden. Things you want to consider is what is your and or your family's favorite vegetables? Okay. How much space do you have? And that's really important. Sweet corn is great, but it takes a lot of space. But when we talk about how much space you have, you also have to consider that plants start small and grow large. So a little, a little um, pepper will grow up to hopefully be a big pepper plant. And it needs space to accommodate its ultimate size. The same with squash. They start small and then they grow quite large, the plant itself. So you want to make sure that as you plan these things out and you think about what do I want to grow, that there's going to be adequate space to grow the types of vegetables you're thinking about. And uh, you can increase, I guess, your growing area by thinking about trellising certain crops like um, whole beans or uh, cucumbers. You can have things cascade off the edge of your, say, raised beds, such as tomatoes or cucumbers and things like that. So you plant them around the perimeter and then basically allow them to cascade over the side, and that can help you expand it. So you really want to kind of think about how much space do I have and what kind of vegetables do I want to grow, and then how much space do those particular vegetables require. And then you may have to make some decisions of, okay, I don't grow this or I grow this or, and so forth. Again, the length of the growing or the harvest season is extremely important for us up here in the Front Range. We have really a relatively short growing season um, and it varies on year to year, a couple of years past, you know, we got lucky we got, you know, our tomatoes in at the end of May before the first uh, freeze uh, early October. This year was kind of unusual, I guess, at least for as long as I've been here, where we had May was actually a pretty good month, and we didn't really have a freeze until a lot of part of this month of October. So it does vary, and we'll talk about how we go about looking for information about uh, maturity of certain uh, vegetable varieties in a little bit later. You want to think about your yield potential. What are you looking for? Well, I love to make tomato sauce, so I want a lot of tomatoes. Well, that's gonna drive maybe either the variety selection and or the number of plants you wanna plant. Um, maybe you only want a few tomatoes. Well, maybe that means you only put one tomato plant in. But if you like a lot of tomatoes, you're gonna put a lot more tomato plants in. What varieties do you like but are hard to find in stores? So I like um, crookneck squash, yellow crookneck squash. But over the last couple of years, it's been really hard to find. So I grow those because I know I can find all the zucchini in the world someplace else. I don't need to grow zucchini. 
Uh, same with wax beans. I love wax beans, but they're hard to find. So I plant wax beans and not green beans. Um, I think it's really important, especially if you have children, um, to grow something that's interesting to allow the children to understand how they grow. So when I had, when both my daughters were much younger in California, which is where I'm from, I usually tried to grow something every year that was different. One year we grew peanuts. Peanuts are not known for growing well in California, especially for the soil type. So I improved a little area of my garden with uh, sand and so forth to make it really loose. And we grew peanuts. And we got just enough peanuts that we could harvest and roast them and they could have a handful of peanuts. But it allowed them to understand that peanuts are a very unique crop to grow if you're not accustomed to it. So I think that's really important as a learning uh, project. And there's nothing wrong with actually saying to a child, this is your tomato plant and I'm gonna help you grow it, but you're in charge of weeding it, things like that. I think that's great for kids. So once you've made all these selections, the next question is, do I, direct seed my vegetable varieties or do I use transplants or starts? So a lot of vegetable varieties are really best grown directly using seed. So root crops, carrots, beets, radishes, etc. Uh, you really should direct seed. Many others like cucumbers and squash, even though yes, you can buy starts of those, uh, they're really better off direct seeding them. Um, the root system is a lot better. Uh, then you have other varieties, usually your warm season uh, crops, tomatoes, peppers, and then some of your cool season, the broccolis, the cabbages, um, better to uh, use uh, transplants. Um, and you'll see probably why a little, in, a, in a little bit. And then we have other vegetables, which um, you can do both. So if you're growing lettuce and spinach, you can actually uh, buy um, a six pack or something and plant those and you will start harvesting those pretty quickly and then you can plant seed of uh, say a different variety so that when the uh, lettuce from the transplants kind of starts you know uh, wearing out you have other plants coming in behind it and I think uh, what's important to consider is that you can plant consecutive crops of a given uh, variety. So if you want lettuce, which you will we'll talk about, um, it's, it's kind of a cool season, you can plant one week, you can plant transplants, wait a couple of weeks, plant seed of a different variety, and maybe the third, and then wait another couple of weeks and plant uh, more lettuce. And this way you get lettuce over a long period of time. You can do the same by looking at maturities. So if you have an early maturing lettuce variety, you can plant that. If you have a later maturing lettuce variety, you can plant that. So the early maturing comes in first, you, you pick lettuce then. And then as that lettuce kind of runs its course, you have a later maturing variety, which you can then transition to and continue harvesting. And so you can do that with most vegetable varieties. You can either do consecutive plantings and or consecutive plantings using different varieties based on uh, early maturing varieties versus mid-season maturing varieties versus late uh, season maturing varieties. So think about this as you start selecting how long do I want to have a vegetable? I want lettuce like all season if I can get away with it. Well, the only way to accomplish that is to have multiple plantings over a period of time. So growing, let's say you, I wanna grow certain plants um, from seed in my own house, whether it's under lights in the basement or elsewhere, what do I do? Well, of course you have to buy the seed um, and then you plant your seed and, and we're gonna use tomatoes and um, peppers as an example. Tomatoes require six to eight weeks. So you plant them six to eight weeks 
before you anticipate putting them in the garden. In peppers, it's eight to 10 weeks before you anticipate putting them in the garden. If there was something else, you would probably want to research a little bit to get a sense of how much time you have to uh, backtrack, if you will, and then plant them before you can put them in the garden. And then before you take them out of your house and put them directly in your garden, you want to harden them off. So the hardening process is you're acclimating those plants that were in your basement under lights. You want to acclimate them to the outdoor environment, both the temperature, sunlight, even wind. So hardening means that you put them out maybe in your patio protected from direct sunlight for a day or two, and maybe you keep them outside for a couple hours and you bring them in at nighttime. And then you begin leaving them out a little bit longer and you begin giving them a little bit more direct sunlight. And then you leave them out overnight. And usually in seven to 10 days, if you have that time, and you should build that into your um, process, they'll be far better suited to go right into the garden. If you take them directly from your basement, put them in the garden, um, it's not to say they won't do well, they, they often will, um, but they're more prone to shock, that shock of, wow, well, I'm outside now, now I have wind, now it's cold. And it may stunt certain varieties a little bit early on. So by hardening them off, uh, you stand a far better chance of them taking off and, and start growing. So I use uh, seed packets here as an example, and you can get a lot of the same information from seed catalogs. Um, you can get some information looking at the tags. If you go to a garden center and you're looking for like tomato plants or pepper plants, you won't get all of it, but you'll get a lot of information reading the tag or reading something that the garden center has posted about each individual variety. So using these packets, it'll tell you you know, the name of the variety, and many times the name doesn't really mean much. It's a marketing thing, or it might tell you the color of a particular, say, tomato. Uh, it's going to tell you whether it's a hybrid versus an open pollinated variety. An open pollinated variety means basically that you can save the seed from one year and plant it the following year, and the plants will be identical. So if everything is supposed to be a red fruited tomato, Every year you plant it, it should be red. Hybrids, on the other hand, are made up of parental lines. They make crosses, and, you, and the end result of making a cross is a hybrid. If you save seed from a hybrid variety, you have a hybrid tomato this year, you save some seed and you're gonna plant it next year, you may not get the same thing. It may look different. Instead of red, it may be yellow. Uh, a lot of that is genetic, but the point is, um, it's not going to be identical. Not to say you couldn't do that, just beware that it may not look like what you planted the, uh, the prior year. So a lot of times they'll tell you about the color of the fruit, the shape of the fruit. The big thing is maturity. And it may be something like it's an early, mid, or late season maturing variety. The other way is they give you an estimated number of days. So it may be 60 days, 70 days, 90 days. All these are just guides. There's a lot of things which can change what maturity is ultimately when they're in your garden, but these are guides. Now in the case of uh, tomatoes and peppers, the maturity is based on when you put the plant into the ground, not when they're seeded in the greenhouse, when you buy the plant in a garden center and it says it's an early maturing variety and you put it in your garden, that means that you should see fruit um, fairly early in our season versus something that's a late season. You should probably see some ripe fruit at the tail end of our growing season. Now, they have the same type of information for uh, those vegetable varieties which can be directly seeded into the garden and generally the maturity is is often based on once the plant emerges from the soil so you plant radishes and the radish seed comes up and you see the all the little seedlings up there for the say a week after then you can start counting maturity from really the time you see them emerge from the soil 
And that'll give you an indication of when you can anticipate uh, harvesting. And of course, as I've said, you know, we have hail that could cut down maturity, change maturity. We get a shot of really cold weather can slow things down. Hot weather can speed things up. So it's a guide, and that's, but it's a valuable guide that you should use, especially up here in the front range. On the back side of the uh, packets, they might have a description. They'll tell you uh, how deep to plant the seed. If you're not familiar with uh, something like that, that's really important. It may tell you the spacing of the seed, maybe every inch, and how far to thin. Uh, germination percentage, uh, sometimes that's important, other times it's not when the seed was packed. Uh, there are certain guidelines which uh, seed companies have to use uh, when they sell seed uh, this way. So you can get a lot of information from a seed packet or a lot of information from uh, a seed catalog. And um, you might want to write those down so as part of your planning process so that you have some idea of when you uh, can anticipate harvest for certain types of items you want in your garden. Okay, let's do, all right. It froze, let's try it, no, here we go, whoops. Sorry about that, let's get out. I don't know what happened here. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. There we go. So we have what we call cool season uh, vegetables and warm season vegetables. Those are kind of the two major categories. And then we break each of those categories down. And so we have cool season vegetables, and then we have the hardy ones. So cool season basically are ones that you can plant and, and they do well on the front end of the season, on the back end of the season. So for us in the front range, you know, you might be able to start planting things depending on what's going on, maybe March, April. And then you can maybe plant uh, in August with the idea that harvest is sometime in the fall. It's a little cloudy in the front range as to, you know, cool season, front and back end. Um, in California, it was very distinct because we have a much longer growing season there. But again, that's they like cool environment. They don't like, you know, 100 degrees in the middle of August. These varieties just don't like it, especially to begin growing. So we have the hardy types of vegetables. They're hardy. Um, again, you can plant these a couple of weeks before uh, last frost. And I think there's Last frost is somewhat considered in the front, at least up in the Fort Collins area, give or take Mother's Day weekend, though there is some movement to consider last frost the week after Mother's Day, but in that ballpark. And we have what we call our semi-hardy vegetable crops. Again, these are ones that don't, you know, you can, they'll take cool, but, you know, they're not that happy like some of the other ones. Um, so you keep these in mind, um, and you can tell sometimes that uh, the season is not be, maybe not the best at that moment. Plants are slow to germinate out of the ground. Um, even if they germinate, they just don't seem to grow very fast, and they can make up lost time once the weather changes more to their liking. But it's important to consider soil temperature when you look at these vegetable varieties. What gets things going is you want to look at the what is the ambient temperature outside and what is the soil temperature. So soil temperature, it gets warmer in raised beds and containers than planted directly into an existing you know, soil in your backyard. It may take another week or two for the soil in the backyard and in the ground to warm up to what's already in the uh, raised beds. So that's really important to think, to keep, kind of keep that in mind. Soil temperature, very important. If you plant a tomato too early, the so it may look, you, you know, it may just look at you and not grow. That's often the case because it's too, too cool. The outside temperature, soil temperature is just too cold for it. Once it warms up, then it takes off. And then we have these warm season veggies. 
Okay, these are the ones that really like summer. And um, so we have a little break. We have the kind of tender ones of warm season. That's your beans, your cucumbers, squash. Okay, they can tolerate a little frost. It can be a little cooler for them. So those are the ones you might want to plant a little bit earlier before maybe you plant your tomatoes. And then we get our very tender, which are your tomatoes, your eggplants, peppers. They don't like it cold at all. They, if it gets too cold, they may not um, die, but they really aren't going to grow. And if it gets cold enough, they actually get stunted and it can often take them quite a while to, um, to get back and start really start actively growing. So let's talk about uh, watering. Uh, you can rely on rainfall, which if you did this season, uh, you're going to be out of luck. Uh, but then you have drip irrigation and there's different types of drip systems. You have flood irrigation. So if you have a raised bed, you can just flood the whole top of the raised bed, let the water um, go into the soil. Or furrow irrigation, where you basically make a furrow, say between uh, two rows of uh, snap beans and water the uh, both rows by running water down that uh, common furrow. Um, there's a lot of different ways. The key on watering is do a good watering. You want to water deep. You water deep, you force the roots of all varieties as far down as you can. They're happier and generally you don't have to water as much. Uh, early on when the plants are first established, Adequate water is extremely important, but as they go on through the season, many of them require less water. And one of the problems or questions I get often asked is, how come I'm, you know, my tomato's not looking very good? I said, well, how often do you water it? And I find they're watering it way too much. They have nothing but vegetation or the plant just is not happy because it doesn't need all that water. So you need to understand the water needs of the varieties that you select. Some are shallow rooted, we talked about it, some are deep rooted. The best way to check is to take a wooden, go find a wooden dowel and poke it down, say in the raised bed or in your container or even out in the soil in your garden and poke it down there and then pull it up and see whether or not you have any wet soil. And that's a good way to tell whether or not you know, you have moisture and where is that moisture located? Moisture right on the surface is not necessarily a good thing. You want that moisture down. If you have a 12 inch high uh, raised bed, you'd like to see that moisture penetrating the entire depth of the raised bed. And then we often get questions about why uh, vegetables in the middle of the day look limp, they're wilting. Do they need, oh, they need water? Well, not necessarily. If it's extremely hot outside, and especially if there's a little wind, which often is the case up here, um, the plant just can't keep up. It's losing more water than it can hold. So their reaction from the plant is to start to wilt. That's their form of protecting themselves. The best way to know whether or not the plant really needs water is one, you can check with your dowel, or better yet, wait till the following morning, go out and look at it. Many plants wilt in the middle of the day when it's super hot, and by early morning the following day, they look just fine. That's because they've kind of caught up. They catch their second wind and they're fine. You have doubt, then go use the dowel system and check on the moisture. But so many people uh, overwater veggies and they really don't need to apply as much water. But group your plants oftentimes is good based on water use. So don't take a high water use veggie and plant it in the middle of a low water use veggie. Um, one of those two vegetables is not going to be a happy camper. So if you're using, if you're planting vegetables, which um, certain types need a lot more water than others, try to group the ones that need more water together so that you can water them as a, as a group, if you will. And you water the ones that take less water as a group. So that's always a, um, uh, a good thing. Mulching your veggie garden is really good. Keeps the weeds down, keeps the soil cooler. 
and it does help, as I say, maintain uh, adequate moisture. And there's different types of mulches you can use that are easy to get. You can use dry uh, grass clippings. Uh, don't use them if you've just recently treated your lawn with uh, chemicals like herbicides and things. There's some information that suggests the chemicals can uh, leach into your soil. You can use several layers of newspaper. I prefer actually shredded newspaper. Breaks down, I think, a little bit easier. And then you can use dry shredded leaves. And a lot of these, at the end of the season, don't take these out. Just turn this material back into your garden. And it adds organic material as they decompose. And the following year, when you plant, you already have done that. You, you already have some new material. So it serves two purposes. Diseases, pests, you know, depending on where you are and what you're growing, you may have certain diseases and pests that might impact your production. Certain varieties like tomatoes and peppers carry um, resistance to many diseases. Most of your so-called heirloom varieties, not necessarily just tomatoes, they're heirloom peppers and heirloom this and that. Most of your heirlooms don't have any disease resistance. Um, so that's something to think about. So, uh, and then we say control pests, whether they're insects, knowing what kind of insects. If you don't know what the insect is, you can certainly call the uh, extension office and uh, ask to talk to a master gardener and, or bring a sample to any of the Q&A booths that the master gardeners set up. We hope in 21 uh, we'll be able to do that um, or take some pictures. Uh, it always helps and we can try to identify what may be the insect or what the problem is and give you a remedy. But you have other pests like bunnies and birds and I guess if you live out you might have deer and other things and those are things you have to you got to think about and come up with a way to maybe control them. And a big thing to think about also is how you grow your veggies and how you grow them will often influence how they either look and or taste. Um, in tomatoes, growth cracks, blossom end rot are to a certain extent cultural issues um, that you have to factor. Oftentimes it's an uneven uh, balance of water in the soil, peaks and valleys, and there's some other things. But many times um, if you uh, don't water adequately, uh, you put the plant under stress and the plant flavor or the quality of the fruit may change because they're under stress. If they're not under stress, then they may have a little different uh, taste to it. Sometimes certain varieties like cucumbers in the old days, if you uh, grew them under a more of a drought condition, they would have a tendency to taste a little bitter than if you grew them with adequate moisture. So keep that in mind that if they don't take, you know, grow them and grow them well, and you'll have good tasting, good looking um, results. So trellising, you know, trellising is a way, again, to give you some vertical uh, growing space, and there's different ways you can trellis. You can trellis both in containers, in raised beds, and out in the, directly in the garden. Again, different types. You can use tomato, tomato cages, not only for tomatoes, but for other vegetable varieties. There's just, you know, you can come up with all kinds of ideas how to trellis, and it gives you that vertical climb and vertical space to grow uh, veggies. There are many uh, varieties out there which are bred specifically and marketed for containers. And what they are is they're fairly uh, compact varieties, uh, tomatoes. Uh, in fact, the Master Gardeners did a trial this, this season in 20, where we looked at three tomatoes, small fruited tomato uh, varieties in containers. And there was one that was very similar to the picture you see there, um, which did quite well. And we see small uh, peppers and small cucumbers, small being they don't take a lot of space. Even some winter squash, they're fairly compact plants. So if you really have even very, very limited space, look for those tomato varieties, uh, rather those vegetable varieties that you can get, you know, adequate production in a fairly compact space. Frost protection, extended growing seasons. Frost, frost protection can go on both ends of your season. So 
early in the spring, you can put it uh, a frost blanket if we think we're going to have some really cold weather. It protects them. And on the end of the season, if say in first of all uh, October there's frost ex uh, expected or a freeze, you can put the uh, frost blankets over and hopefully you know maybe get a week or two of additional growing time. Uh, hail cloth is is very I think very beneficial in the front range. Um, hail can start give or take around April and end sometime the end of September. And I'm, I'm sure if you've been in the area, you've heard stories how hail storm comes in and can wipe out your whole garden. Uh, so hail cloth is really a very valuable thing or some sort of protection against hail uh, can really save your garden. Um, you can use plastic coverings. You just want to make sure your plants don't touch the plastic. Um, but there's a lot of forms. You can go online and search like frost blankets. There's different thicknesses for different, if you will, boost on, on temperature. Uh, you also have to, and there's also different densities. They allow certain certain amount of light or, or, to, or a lot of shade. And you have to look for something that works for your intent of having it. If you're going to put it on early in the season, you want to make sure there's adequate light that penetrates so the plants actually get light to grow and yet still protect them from some cold weather. Tips for harvesting, uh, really it's like remove, even if you don't uh, want to um, save like you're tired of zucchinis for a while and you just let them, I don't want to pick them anymore, I'm tired. Well, things like uh, squash, cucumbers, um, they will go, once they kind of reach the fruit that stays on there, they go to seed. They actually get into that, I'm going to develop and mature the seed inside the individual fruit. And the plant shuts down from producing new fruit. So always remove uh, fruit from your veggies, even if you don't want it, because by doing so, they keep producing veggies. So in a couple of weeks, you can go back and pick your zucchini. Um, Removing those who um, hit the correct size allows those that haven't hit that stage to continue growing. So we see that in root crops a lot, like radishes. You can take out the radishes which have got to the size you want, and there's going to be radishes that haven't gotten to that size. By removing the ones that have gotten to the size, it gives room for those uh, smaller plants to grow in, and you can pick them in a couple of weeks. Uh, understand what's the best size. That's really in key. So um, read the package, read the catalogs, and try to pick at the best stage and you get the best fruit quality when you do that. If you grow peppers and you want red peppers, you have to understand that most peppers go from a green stage to a color stage. And it may take seven plus days, 10 plus days to go from green to red in peppers. So you want to build that into your plan if that's really what you want. If all you care about is, is green peppers, you don't have to worry about it. But if you want a lot of red peppers, you need to factor that in. You have to realize that onions and garlics, when the tops begin to fall over, you got to stop watering them. They're done. They don't want water. Water is not good for them. Um, and then you need to realize also that certain uh, vegetable varieties do not ripen once they're picked. So tomatoes will ripen, the honeydew melons don't ripen. If you pick a honeydew ripe, a honeydew melon and it's under, it's not ripe, it will not ripe, ripen on your, uh, in your kitchen. So there are things like that to always consider. And then finally, don't, don't forget there are other edibles, whether they're herbs or edible flowers. And of course, with any of those, you don't want to use any kind of chemicals on them. But I always like to try to grow some edible flowers. I, I like nasturtiums; it's got a nice flavor to it. But there's all kinds of other ones. So don't don't forget these. All right. So let's very quickly, and I mean very quickly, we'll go through them because I've um, and talk a little bit about some of the vegetables. Tomatoes are pretty self-explanatory. I think the thing to keep in mind that people um, often ask me about is there's two basic types of tomato plants. A determinant plant, it grows on the ground. You don't need to stake it. It's going to say on the label or someplace, a determinant plant habit. 
Uh, it often has more concentrated fruit set, but because we have a relatively short growing season, that can be conducive because you're going to get a lot of tomatoes in that very short period of time. The other type, which is generally what you see in heirlooms and many, uh, many hybrids, is an indeterminate plant habit. They need to be staked in some fashion. They kind of continue to grow vertical. There's nothing wrong with either one except other than how you grow them. If you don't want to spend the time staking and all that, then you might want to try a, a determinate habit. But you see those in the garden centers, you see those in the catalogs, and that's really the big distinction is the size of the plant and how you grow it, staked versus non-staked. We won't, you all know about different types of shapes, there's, and that, that holds true with most uh, vegetable varieties. Uh, some tomatoes have what we call shoulders, uh, green shoulders, others what we don't have any green, and that's okay. It just depends on the uh, tomato variety. Okay, let's go back. Here we go. One real important thing is don't ever put your tomatoes in the refrigerator to store them. You can put them in to chill them before you're gonna serve them, but you don't want us to store tomatoes in a refrigerator. The cold temperature uh, does not help the flavor of the tomatoes. Just store them out on the uh, counter. Uh, tomatoes, you wanna plant them deep. They're one of the few vegetables you really want plant plant deep because roots will come from the stem. That's not the case in most vegetables. Peppers, really popular out here. You basically have sweet peppers, hot peppers. Um, big difference in growing peppers is you want to remove all the young flowers and little peppers. You want to push them early after you put them in the ground so they get good sized plant and then let fruit to set. You don't do that, you will have fruit on a little plant and you want to have a big plant and a lot more fruit. Uh, so again, we have sweet peppers. This shows you various types. Again, a lot of these started green and then they turn color. There are a few varieties which actually start in, uh, in a different color shade than green. So we talked about this. Um, hot peppers, same thing. You've got all these different types of hot peppers. And a lot of the hot peppers start in green and go to a different color. So again, it's what you're looking for. Usually green and hot peppers, they're not as hot as when they mature. Um, we'll skip hot is, is just a factor. There's a lot of ways to test hot. It's how it's distinct. You can taste it and come up with a couple different things. A lot of times you'll see what they, they'll list them on the Scoville scale, which basically says, the higher the number, the hotter they are. One way though that you can reduce the heat level on any pepper uh, is to remove the seed in that white membrane that is, surrounds the seed. If you basically you see the ones that are cut, the ones on the top of that, they have seed in that membrane. If you remove them so they look like the ones on the bottom of that picture, uh, then the pepper uh, will, be, uh, will not have quite that uh, heat level. And that's because Seed and, and the membranes generally is where the um, chemical is stored. Summer squash, again, summer squash comes in all different kinds of colors and shapes. And um, some of these have open plant habits and that's beneficial because they're easy to harvest. Some are very compact and you might want to wear gloves or long sleeve because it can be a little prickly depending on the variety. This is one I always like to show because people ask me, well, my, I don't see any squash or cucumbers. I said, do you have female flowers? And I said, I don't know. So when you look at things like squash, cucumbers, melons, you know that you have female flowers when you look at the plant and you see these little baby uh, fruit. And the flower hasn't opened. You can see that the arrows are pointing to little bitty squash, little bitty cucumber. Those are your female flowers. If you look at a plant and all you see are flowers and they don't have these little baby fruit, all you're seeing are male flowers. And generally male flowers start earlier, then the females come on board, and then you have both male and female flowers. But that's an easy way to tell whether or not you have female flowers, is look for the baby fruit. 
you'll be fine. Um, I'm checking my time. So eggplants uh, are great. They, like anything else, they come in a variety of things. Keep in mind on eggplants that there's a concentration of seed or on the blossom end, which is down here. Not that there's that many seed, but that's generally where you see a concentration. And use clippers to harvest them. It's just picking them off like almost impossible. And then you have all your root crops. And I told Allison I had to tell the story, so I'm going to get through this. Carrots. These are the, your various carrot shapes. The imperator types are the ones that are most commonly seen in supermarkets. So here's the history of the baby carrot. A long time ago, I used to be a carrot breeder and I was talking to a, a big uh, uh, harvesting company who sold carrots. And this is a long time ago, 40 plus years. And he says to me, here, I want you to see my new baby carrot line. I said, what do you mean? Are you growing baby carrots? Said, no, 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 watch. So he takes these long imperator types and he cuts the tip off, the bottom of the carrot off. And he had developed a machine that would shape that tip into the so-called baby carrot look that you see in the grocery stores in those cellophane packages. And that whole idea in the machines that they initially developed basically established the so-called baby carrot commodity that you see in, in the grocery stores, even to this day. It's not that they're out there growing baby carrots. They're out there basically growing carrots that they're putting through a machine that sh reshapes them to this shape and then puts them in a packet. So that's the baby carrot story. Um, we're about out of time. Um, most of this is just really, I'll just go quickly, turnips. Give you different colors, different shapes. Radishes are the same array of color and shapes. The big white ones are the daikon radishes, which can grow here. They're really great. Uh, beets, you're used to seeing the globe shape, the purple, orange, but there's these uh, varieties that are really long and, and they're great in the middle. And there are actually a couple of varieties of beets that they grow only really predominantly for beet greens. I'm not a greens, a beet green fan, but if you are, you look for those particular varieties. Parsnips are parsnips. Kohlrabi is, they consider it a root crop, even though it actually grows on the top of the soil, not in the soil like a parsnip. But if you haven't grown, kohlrabis are great. I like those. Beans, you have different types of beans. Keep in mind that um, the difference between a pole bean and a bush bean and if you want to pull stuff, they're great. Many beans from a harvest standpoint should be picked and you need to look at the packets. If you pick some that are intended to be picked young and you pick them when they're old, they're going to be tough. So keep in mind when you plant, what's a good stage and try to pick them at that stage. So we'll just go through leafy greens that you can grow. I know that broccoli grows well up here. The key with broccoli is not only pick the center head, but then let the side shoots grow and you'll get more. Um, cauliflower, if you pick the right variety, should do okay out here, but it needs to be an early maturing variety. Same with cabbage, are generally grown by uh, starts. Uh, bok choy does do well, and I direct seed bok choy in my garden, and it does very well. Onions, we've talked about that. I know a lot of people grow onions. You want to there's onions, there's long days and short days. Um, generally, we grow a lot of yellow onions. The key, again, as I told you, when the tops fall over, stop watering them. You let them dry in the soil for about a week before you pick them. And then we have winter squash. And again, winter squash are generally fairly large plants, but there are certain varieties which are more bush in nature. And, uh, you know, you have to look at maturity and you can grow them. Uh, up here. And then finally, before we get to questions, I just want to point out one really important thing is based on what we saw in 2020, based on the trade magazines I, I read, um, a lot of seed companies ran out of seed because everybody was growing veggie gardens, which is a good thing. Just nobody really anticipated it because of the virus. So if you're thinking about something unique for, for 2021, I would suggest you really consider maybe ordering early rather than waiting to the end because 
those varieties may or may not be available. And I would even say extend that to our current garden centers. Um, I know talking to some of the centers, they were really running out of certain varieties early in the season because everybody was up buying them. So keep that in mind as we get into 21, depending on how things go, uh, it might be better to um, plan a little bit ahead and get what you really want um, rather than maybe wait. So with that, I appreciate everybody showing up and I'll try to answer some questions in a, in a little bit of time. Thank you, John. We'll let you get a drink of water. <laughs> um, we just have a few questions and if you have any more, please type them in. We can take questions as long as you need. Uh, if you do need to leave us, we totally understand. So don't feel obligated to stay since we were holding this to an hour. So John, the first question, which is fun, is what do they do with all of the baby carrot shavings? What do they do with all of that? Well, that's an interesting question. What they, what they did is, so they made baby carrots from, if you will, the bottom of the carrot root, and they sold the top half of the root in the grocery store like you would normally. The shavings, as far as I can remember, probably went out to either for composting and or chicken feed. Nice. Maybe pigs, too. Pigs love that stuff. If you didn't know, uh, marigolds uh, used to be grown. I don't know if they still are. Marigold flowers uh, were ground up and put into chicken feed, and that was a natural way to enhance the color of the yolk. I have bought chicken treats with marigolds in them for that reason. There, uh, there was a question that stemmed back to when you were talking about container plantings, and I'm happy to answer this, John, but uh, is it wise to put gravel on the bottom of the container with the idea to improve drainage? I know this is a myth out there, so if you want to handle it, that's cool. Otherwise, I can give my two cents on that one. Well, I think we would probably have some, some, some difference of opinion. I think if you put a really thin layer of gravel, probably doesn't do any good. Um, it could actually, depending on the gravel, could plug the holes up that you put in for drainage or at least reduce the flow outward. Um, some people like to put gravel on the bottom of the containers, others don't. Um, Allison may have a more scientific reason why you should do one versus the other, but um, a lot of it is just preference. Yeah, the only thing I see is if you put too much gravel, you're actually reducing the rooting volume of your plants, um, and it doesn't improve drainage. It's not how the properties of water and soil physics work. So if you need to do it to take up space, that's one thing, um, but don't think that you're doing it and actually to improve drainage. Uh, the other question, we have a couple more. So Sandy wanted to know that she has purchased bags of compost with like wood chip material or mushroom compost. Are these okay to use? Is that a good amendment to consider? Well, certainly mushroom compost is uh, wood. There's nothing in theory wrong with wood chips. Um, of course, you might want to ask, you know, where the wood chips came from. Um, the wood chips will take a, probably, depending on the size, could take a little bit longer to decompose versus um, compost, which is already basically decomposed material. But again, I think the key is putting organic material in and really working it into the to the container or the or the raised bed or wherever you're putting it really you know dig it in and and try to blend it and if you're using some people like to use manure but you have to be careful if you especially if you're using fresh manure um, that it can be you know fresh out of the cow if you will is not the best thing to directly plant you want to maybe put it in the in the fall and let it mellow out um, and then in the spring you're fine. So, um, but generally speaking, materials will decompose faster if they're smaller in size. And a tip about the mushroom compost, it's not actually mushrooms, it's the media that the mushrooms are grown in, which is mostly wood-based. So that's probably why you're seeing a lot of wood in there. Um, Elon had a question about controlling aphids, powdery mildew in snails without chemicals. It's kind of a, a big topic and I could send out some information, but if you want to just touch on that, John, that would be super. Well, snails, I mean, you know, you can, you can use a 
good thing to, to try to help control um, on some vegetables, not all, um, is trying to keep, if you plant a tomato or a pepper, try to remove the veg, some of the vegetation, maybe a couple of inches so that there's, it's clear from the soil up to the plant. So there's, and that helps air movement. It also removes some hiding places like for snails and things. Keeping your garden clean. So if you weed or you take plants out, try to keep it fairly clean. Again, you're, you're removing the sources or places where insects can hide, where diseases can, can start growing and spreading. So good sanitation practices around your veggie garden um, certainly helps a lot. Um, mildew, try not to, not to water overhead. I realize it on occasion rains here and there's not much you can do about it. But when you water your things, you want to water at the base of the plants, if you will, versus use a sprinkler or, or a hose and, and spray the top. Um, you might get away with that when they're super young, but certainly as they mature, you really want to try to minimize how much water gets on top of the plants because that can cause in certain varieties some mildew and other issues related to that. Um, and there are some, or, you know, organic um, products out there that you can apply for various, whether it's for various pests, whether they're snails or otherwise. Um, so I got two follow-up questions and I'm just going to speak on them. So you mentioned sanitation. For those of you who had any disease, insect, pest issues, get all of that material out of the garden and throw it in the trash. You don't want to leave it to overwinter. You don't want to till it in um, because it can just perpetuate the problem. So sanitation is key. And treating now for powdery mildew doesn't make sense. You actually need the proper conditions and those start in the spring. So you don't need to do any preventative treatment at this time. Uh, Barbara wanted to know if you had advice on growing rhubarb. I know rhubarb grows here. I can't say that I've grown any. I do know some, some friends who have grown it. Uh, rhubarb is one of those like asparagus, which may take more than one season to really get going. So if you plant, I know a couple of the nurseries in the area sell them as plants, um, like a one or two gallon size, you can put them in the ground and you, you know, it may, the first year you might harvest lightly. Uh, I know you can buy rhubarb roots, bare root, if you will, uh, that you can put in the same principle. You want to give them a year or two to get established. Um, and then every year you can pick a little bit more. And then there's a point, and I can't tell you anymore what the point is. There is a point where you stop harvesting and allow the plant to basically build up its energy and, and, and grow. And you can do that. I don't know if you can grow asparagus here, but if same principle holds with rhubarb and asparagus and some of those other crops that open, you know, that can overwinter. Perfect. Can you reuse soil in raised beds? Yeah, I would not, unless there's a real reason that you see to remove it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just, yeah, I've used the basic and then I keep every year, I keep improving upon it. And um, now there, again, you know, I don't see real reason on say large pots. Um, you may um, maybe every so often do that. And Allison may have a better information about that. If your plants are really showing, you know, some weird things, especially on decent sized raised beds, you know, you might want to send a soil test in and you know maybe indicate some concerns and see what the test shows and it may be that it may be deficient in some things and maybe by improving those factors your soil gets gets better um you can and i don't know where i'm at but my water is really good quality water if you were to have uh, less than great quality water maybe out of a well or some places you might have an issue with some salt buildup in in the mix or in the soil and some of that can be corrected by um leaching especially if they're in a, in a in a pot or something where you really try to leach leach out every so often um and that may if it builds up in time it may require you to maybe remove it and add some fresh soil 
but maybe Allison, you have some experience you can add to that. Um, I would say for raised beds, I think if you can do what you can to amend it, just I would keep getting a soil test. So every few years, make sure you're testing the soil because you can over amend things and then it gets difficult to correct it. So be cautious with your amendments, but for the first few years, applying compost or doing a cover crop, like John said, is a perfectly good idea. In containers, the recommendation is to replace about a half or a third each year if you're able. Um, we realize it's expensive, so you'll kind of know when your container media starts to break down. It's not going to be as porous or well-drained, so, but replace that every few years. John, any tips on growing lima beans? I was just consulting our information and all our guidance says is that they're marginally hardy. Well, lima beans are, I mean, they're like, they do want a really warm, um, I've grown lima beans, but not here in, in Colorado. Um, there, there are large lima beans and baby limas. I mean, that, there are actually two sizes of, of the bean. Um, lima beans basically want it hot. And um, that's the real key. So could you grow them here? I think you would have to look and try to pick something that is a really short maturing variety. And it's something, you know, if you got a little space, give it a shot. I mean, if it, it'll tell you if it, how well it does, but you may, you may not do as well as if they grew, if you were growing them in Georgia or someplace where they do really well. But um, if you really key is the maturity, and make sure it, it gets in where it gets a lot of sun and like a raised bed where that soil heats up fast. And in theory, the lemon beans should do okay. So maybe wait to plant those until well after June 1st, but get yeah. a short day variety so that you have those heat units. Exactly. And then the last question from Marilyn is what causes short or stunted corn? I have a feeling I know the answer to that one. Um, yeah, I might let you answer that, especially here, because I'm not familiar with, I'm assuming that's sweet corn, and I'm not that familiar with sweet corn in, in this environment, so I'll let you answer that question. I would think, Marilyn, it's going to be a watering issue. Corn takes a lot of water, especially on very hot days, so um, that's a crop that is, is quite water-loving, so I'm thinking you probably need to increase the water a little bit, and also think about the, the variety that you're planting and make sure that it is one that it's probably within that not knowing where you're growing 90 to 100 day growing season but there's a lot of sweet corn that you can get but water it copiously yeah then there are lots of thank yous john um i appreciate that so for all of you who are still on this call this will be converted to youtube um, there have been several requests for john's handouts and so we'll send the pdf if you will, John, along with some other information that I'll provide in that email correspondence. And just a lot of compliments. Thanks again, John. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today. And we do have other classes posted on the Cohorts blog website. So we have a few more on Fridays and then a couple others with libraries coming up in November and December. So thank you for joining us. And on behalf of CSU Extension, have a great afternoon. Bye.